Hey, everybody. Welcome. Happy Friday. I hope you are happy and healthy. We are once again joined on the Wine and Ad Tech podcast by the wonderful Jeremy Carter from Tarpon Cellars. Jeremy rocking a beautiful Grateful Dead t-shirt. I have my uh, sweat rag. For those who know me know I sweat quite a bit. And I will be wiping my brow with this rainbow bear as we go about. But Jeremy, welcome. Uh, what's up, man? What's new? Not too much. Just uh, hanging in out here. Uh, things are looking good on the, um, the food and wine scene out here. Things seem to be opening back up like everybody else. So, um, no, it's good to be back. Thanks for having me back on. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm all about a plug. Uh, if you want to try some of Jeremy's wines, you can go to Google Tarpon Cellars. He'll ship it to you wherever you are. He ships it really quick when the warehouse lets him in the weather. Uh, uh, cooperates, but you don't want your wine shipped when the weather is bad. So uh, let him do what he knows how he does. That makes sense, kind of, right? Yeah, yeah a little bit. Yes. Yeah, uh, so good. today, yeah. So today we are going to talk uh, about Zinfandel a little bit in particular um, at, at Jeremy's request, which I think is awesome. So let's just start with what are you drinking on the Zin side? Yeah, so um, right now I'm actually drinking a uh, Ridge, um, Three Valleys, uh, Zinfandel. Yeah. And so Ridge, um, I know you're pretty familiar with it, but just for people at home, Ridge is classic California wine producer. Uh, they were actually in like the, the tasting of Paris in 1976 um, for Cabernet. Uh, but they're up in the Santa Cruz Mountains and just like totally old school California. And um, they do a lot of really cool field blends. So this one's actually like 72% Zen, 14% Petite Syrah. And it's got some Carignan and actually Mataro in there. So uh, yeah, really cool. And I love the way the Ridge is. They're very um, acid driven and fruit forward. So the, you know, sometimes you get those big, huge jammy Zins. Uh, and this yep. is a more restrained Love it. And I, last night, drank the Gurgich Hills Estate, uh, 2014 Napa. Um, this was awesome. I, it definitely needed time to open up. Um, I don't typically have the patience for that, so I crushed a glass right away. Uh, but I like, to, I like to give the drink to it a little bit at the beginning and then try it again in 10 minutes, uh, as opposed to letting it sit um, the whole time. I just, you know, I don't have the patience to watch it, uh, but it was great. A lot of, uh, a lot of good spice in there. Uh, definitely a good pairing with like a marinara or something along those lines. Um, it just was a, it was a great, great bottle. Um, and Gurgit, you mentioned Ridge in the same bench, um, actually gained fame because their Chardonnay won the, uh, the Paris tasting in 76. Um, and I found out as we will um, talk a little bit more about Zinfandel that um, it's a Croatian grape, they say, and that Gurgic is Croatian. So kind of cool that they're growing, uh, you know, they got the Croatian flag here. They're growing uh, Zinfandel. So um, awesome. Couple of, couple of strong Napa Zins. Um, so Jeremy, tell me a little bit more about Zinfandel. Um, yeah, so it's uh, a lot of people, unfortunately, I think when they hear Zinfandel, they think back to like the 70s, 80s when the white Zinfandel craze was. Um, but it's actually, uh, you actually just told me this. I didn't even realize it's the second most planted grape in Napa. Um, but it has this really cool history uh, throughout California. Um, we, you know, it came over with Italian immigrants and we didn't know necessarily where it came from. They think the first plantings were actually from Austria. Um, but UC Davis, which is kind of our like um, viticulture research uh, university out here, they found that through DNA testing, it's actually a Croatian grape, as you mentioned. Um, but it has just this really cool history. Uh, it came over like in the 1820s, um, you know, made it through Phylloxera, made it through um, the gold rush, and then, uh, you know, with uh, Prohibition as well. And um, yeah, I mean, at one point in the late 1880s, like one third of the total grape production in California was Infandel. And uh, you still have a lot of these old vines that were planted in the 60s. and um, if I can do a little tease or a, a plug, actually, we're going to make a yeah. Zinfandel uh, this year. Oh, nice. Yeah, and so it's, um, it's a dry farmed, uh, head trained Zin uh, in Dry Creek. And, it's, uh, and those grapes or those vines were planted in 1969. So it's just, uh, it's really cool. I mean, I think anytime that you can kind of explore like the history of California wine, 
um, you know, especially for me being a producer out here, like it's, it's pretty cool. So, I mean, and 1969 was a pretty good, pretty good year for, uh, for me. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We, I would drink. Yeah. I suppose we should be drinking everything from 1969. And so right. are you going to throw, are you going to throw like uh, OV on the bottle then? Or, or, you know, the general rule of thumb is what, like 40 or 50 years old and, and you can start to kind of tout it as old vine or old grape. You know, I, I don't, think there's a um a true there's no real rule right yeah. kind of like when people put reserve on there like reserve could mean sure. anything um yeah but i think i think 1969 qualifies as old vine um but uh but no that's the you know especially in sonoma county they have a lot of old vines in and it's really cool just to go see these you know their their root stocks are like this big and it's just really cool yeah. to see like small trees that are just cranking out these grapes it's awesome yeah, no, that is that is really cool. And certainly, I think you hit the nail on the head. People avoid Zinfandel because of the association with white Zinfandel. Um, and it really is a, it's a wine drinker's wine. I mean, if you like red wine, there's just no possible way you're not going to like Zinfandel. And um, because it doesn't have the cachet of, of Cab in Napa, I mean, we're, the Ridge and the Gurdich are, those are two heavy hitters. And these bottles are, I think the Ridge is maybe 28, 29, and the, the Gurgich is maybe 35, um, you know, which isn't cheap sort of every day, but that's an approachable price for a, a quality wine. Yeah, it, uh, it's great value for sure. And um, one thing that I love about it too, from a winemaking standpoint, is that there are these really huge clusters, and so they don't always uh, ripen evenly which if it was Cabernet, that would kind of be an issue because uh, you want everything kind of, you know, similar, but um, in terms of ripeness, but with Zin, like the underripe berries bring a ton of acid. Uh, and then you get these overripe berries that are almost raisiny that give it that kind of like jam and port like quality sometimes. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the other thing too, is I would tell people, uh, you know, don't be scared by alcohol um, because it, it gets pretty yeah. high in Zinfandel, uh, mm -hmm. you know, but sometimes like, I mean, you can have a, 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 a Zin with 15.8 alcohol and it's really balanced. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's, that's what's so neat about the grape is it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty different than a lot of the varietals that we typically think of in terms of like Bordeaux and, and Burgundy and stuff. Yeah, awesome. I love it. Go get some Zins and wait for uh, you guys to release it and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be in line grabbing it. So, um, what do we... Um, we got a little information on Zen. Uh, do you, you want to throw an ad tech softball at me for the uh, the break of wine here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my question for you is, uh, if I'm looking for a DSP or a programmatic partner, um, and this is something that I know very little about, uh, so where would I start with that and how would I know kind of what to look for? Yeah, so great question. Uh, I think the like anything else, there are a number of different options. And how do you differentiate between cars, right? When you go and buy a car, what's what's the real difference between Toyota, Honda, Hyundai, Ford, Chevy, right? They're all kind of in that same tier. Uh, I think the first thing you got to find is, you know, what's a fit for your business? Um, there are definitely large players in the space in a Google and, and trade desk and, uh, you know, Amazon has a DSP. Is that is that going to fit your business and everything you need from a service standpoint to a technical standpoint? Then I think I'd talk to some friends in the industry, right? Um, you know, there is a an ad tech version of Yelp called G2 Crowd, uh, which does give you verified user reviews uh, for all things ad tech and martech and software platforms in general. Um, you know, I'm happy to highlight that as, as my DSP is the number one DSP, according to them, and the verified user reviews. But, uh, you know, similar to Yelp, use it directionally. I wouldn't rule out anyone in the top tier, and I would sort of take a second look at anyone in the bottom tier. If you're getting that many bad user reviews, that seems to be more powerful than um, a handful of good ones, you know. Uh, people are less likely to come on and write something really good uh, as they are really bad. And so uh, the more really bad reviews you can avoid, the better typically. So I would go there and then, you know, your, your friends in the industry and, and advice from people is helpful. And then it's just a comfort level. If you're just doing basic programmatic buying, 
Uh, there's not a ton of differentiation. And so you just want to be happy. You want under, you want transparency, you want transparency in pricing. Um, and then, you know, if you're running across multiple platforms, uh, find something that is going to help you keep track of all of those different platforms. So uh, beyond a DSP, a programmatic partner that can help you manage your search, your social, uh, and have all of that working together is actually really important too. You don't want those siloed. It, it would probably not be the best option to hire a separate social partner, a separate search optimization partner, and a separate display partner. Um, so great question. Let's head back to Zintown, USA and talk a little bit about a wine and music or movie pairing. What do you got for me, Jeremy? Okay. You want me to go first? Yeah, go for it. Okay, cool. Uh, so I started thinking about what music would go well with Zinfandel. And when I think of Zinfandel, uh, I think of jammy. And so uh, that transitioned into uh, jam bands. And, uh, you know, it's funny because we've been home so much. Uh, I've been listening to a ton of records, which is awesome because I'm catching up on my vinyl collection and um, probably spending too much money on it, to be honest. But, uh, but now that I'm getting back in the car and going out and checking in vineyards and, you know, running errands and going to the winery and stuff, uh, I'm back on Spotify. And uh, Spotify has so many good, uh, you know, old fish shows uh, and dead shows, actually. Um, mm -hmm. But the one that I've been listening to a lot lately is that 5794 fish. And that's at the Bomb Factory, which I believe is in Dallas. Oh, yeah. And it's just yes. awesome. I mean, it's so raw. Um, it's so powerful. Trey is like on fire. Uh, they go like in and out of tweezer like all night. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's got an amazing grace acapella and the encore. Um, really good loving cup, I believe. Um, but yeah, yeah. it's just. I never get tired of that one. I actually had that on CD when they came out with it on the Fish Live thing in like, you know, 2002 or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Bomb Factory Tweet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So I, um, I am pairing, and we didn't plan this, but I am also going to drink this tonight, which you are drinking right now. Mine's the yep. 2017 Vintage. Is that the one that you've got as well? I actually have 18. I've got the, I got the Three Valleys. Yeah, so I'll try this. It's also a blend. Um, Zin, Petit Salah, uh, Carignan, and Grenache. So um, could be okay. interesting. Um, and I'm going to, a friend of mine, in fact, our old buddy Matt's brother sent me a live Dire Straits concert uh, from like 83 at the Alchemist, I believe it was. Um, I will put the link in the comment section here, but it opens with Once Upon a Time in the West. And if you're not a Dire Straits fan, you probably don't know that song because it's not one of their, um, but Mark Knopfler just absolutely shreds. Um, and I think they are sometimes forgotten or remembered incorrectly, much like Zinfandel and White Zin. They are remembered as, you know, I want my MTV, uh, but they are a much deeper band than that. And they are very good musicians. And that opening Once Upon a Time in the West has been, I would put that on loop right now. That's how I feel about it. So I highly recommend it. Um, and a really cool band. Uh, and again, hearkening back to people who actually watch these week in and week out, Mark Knopfler, the lead guitar player is from Newcastle, who was highlighted when I was um, doing the bartending and the cocktail episode with Drew. We are big Newcastle fans. Uh, all right, wine and food. What are you doing? What are you going to put with it? So Zinfandel is pretty flexible. Um, you know, I, I always think of, it's got, always got like this white pepper and a little bit of a smoky touch to it. Um, especially actually this one, at least the 2018 that I have. Um, so I'm pairing it with either a barbecue, um, you know, uh, pulled pork, uh, some ribs in the smoker, whatever you got. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually been on a little bit of a vegetarian kick 